So good evening, everyone. Welcome to Science at the Theater's uh, seven big ideas. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. You will understand, one of our speakers had a medical emergency and she cannot attend. But if this format succeeds, we'll likely do it again in the fall, so she will have her chance to do that. So that's Carolyn Larabelle, so um, we wish you well. Uh, as you know, we like to experiment with the formats at Science at the Theater, and I think tonight we've probably pushed the limits. Uh, we are going to ask our now seven Berkeley Lab scientists to uh, educate, excite, and inspire you in just eight minutes. Only eight minutes. Now, contrary to popular opinion, uh, scientists, you know, are not necessarily secretive, somber, or silent people. They actually can be quite chatty. <laughs> so this will be a challenge. We assume that they can do it. Uh, we know that they can. But just in case, Ross, we have a timer. <laughs> so as a test this evening, I would like you at about the 7.45 minute mark just to applaud very softly. So let's practice. <laughs> practice. Soft applause. Maybe a little louder. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. And then when, that'll tell the speakers that they have just, you know, 10 seconds or so to wrap it up. And then when they're done, you can applaud wildly. <laughs> With that, I think that's probably all I need to say at this point, and I will now ask you to give a warm welcome to our first presenter, Mr. Blake Simmons, who's going to be talking about some big ideas with microbes. Uh, I'm not used to the timer running up, so please bear with me. Um, and I also want to take just a moment aside, I can't believe you missed this PR moment, the, to wish all the mothers in the audience a belated Happy Mother's Day. That's a great filler, by the way, for future reference. Thank you very much for all that you do, and hopefully I won't embarrass mine tonight. And I hope you're watching, Mom. Okay, so the, the main message that I want to convey to you is that uh, we are faced with some unprecedented challenges in terms of the carbon balance on the planet and also on the economic forces at play around energy and chemistry. And uh, I wanted to start off this by giving you a, a perspective on what we talk about when we are conveying some messages about renewable energy and renewable fuels and chemicals. And instead of just focusing on one particular product, I wanted to give you an idea of what we face when we're really talking about replacing the whole barrel of oil. And uh, the title of the talk was a little uh, stilted. It's not replacing a barrel of oil, which we could probably do today, but replacing the whole barrel of oil for humanity to really enable this low carbon economy that you hear a lot about to address greenhouse gas emissions and other items. Um, exactly. So, but in order for a new low carbon bio-based economy to really become reality, it's not sufficient nor sustainable to just focus on one product. You really have to go after and understand that out of a single barrel of oil, you get diesel, other distillates, jet fuel, um, other products such as uh, polymers, heavy fuel oil, which is kind of the uh, residuals from a whole barrel of oil, liquefied petroleum gases, and of course, gasoline. Um, and this requires an integrated systems approach. And it's something that the scientific community and industry really haven't addressed yet because it's typically that you only hear about a single point solution. And what you need is a system of system solutions to make that happen. And also, to put it in perspective, and I've heard you know, a lot of people around this neighborhood talk about, oh, it's just another Apollo space program or a moonshot, and we'll be there. Um, not even close. The cost of oil imports, and this is not just from the United States, but China and the EU. In the United States, it was about $300 billion in 2010. That's two times the entire budget of the Apollo space program per year. Uh, in China, that's about $135 billion. That's five of the Three Gorges dams built each year. In the EU, uh, about 300 billion, same as the United States, it's 20 times the channel, which I don't think they have enough available coastline to actually make happen. And so, it, you know, it's an enormous problem. And to think that we're going to achieve the end state in 24 to 36 months just isn't practical. But that also opens up the door to significant advances in science and technology to make it both affordable and truly sustainable. And the goals in greenhouse gas emission reductions in, uh, in the state of California is certainly leading the way, so applause there as well. We live in one of the best states in the nation in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions. 
And AB 32 set these really aggressive greenhouse gas targets to achieve 1990 levels by 2020, which from a science and technology perspective is right around the corner, uh, and 80% below the 90 levels by 2050. And the, there are a lot of advances that can happen in terms of renewable liquid fuels, batteries and fuel cells, and you have a bunch of different scenarios that have been uh, postulated to meet that goal. And so you have light duty vehicle scenarios, and I apologize for the slide being really small, but you have a bunch of different technology scenarios to help meet uh, the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets for the state. And then nationally, uh, there is a recent report called the Transportation Energy Futures, and I really encourage you to take a look at this report, that goes over the advanced fuels and advanced engines and technology sector crossover to make it happen. So there's a lot of hope out there, but there's not a, real, a lot of reality yet. And that's part of what we try to do at the place that I work at, the Joint Bioenergy Institute, is to help make the next transportation revolution happen sooner rather than later. And also to give you an idea of the baseline, uh, th these are the current estimates for renewable chemical production. So again, it's not just fuels, it's also chemicals. Uh, here's the bio-related sales in terms of billions. And you have you know, a whole list of products here uh, in terms of like ethanol and biodiesel for biofuels. Uh, you have natural rubber, polylactic acid, and polyols. But you sum it all up, and it looks really impressive, right? $95.5 billion in annual sales. But you put that in the context of the 4.7 trillion that we spend in this market each year worldwide, and it is a pittance. And so you really need to uh, be serious about it and appreciate the size of the problem before you can start addressing it. And building the sugar economy. A lot of what I'm going to talk about are uh, products that can be derived from sugar, realized from sustainable lignocellulosic biomass. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to convey the message that pretty much everything that we derive from a barrel of oil we can replace based on biologically derived processes. So it's not a question of if, it's a matter of how much and how soon. And that is a, a, a real message of inspiration for me every day I wake up and that that's what makes me uh, go to work happy. And now, there's a lot of debate around food and fuel or food versus fuel in biomass and biofuels. Um, I want to point out this USDA DOE study that was uh, called affectionately the billion ton study. And by telling you that, you probably understand the punchline already. Uh, but it projected that if you set aside food production, um, you set aside some of the conservation lands, and you really look at the deployment of agricultural resources and potential crops that could be dedicated for energy, um, it's about a billion tons by 2030. And so it, if you follow that through all the way to the chemical production element, a billion tons of this domestic sustainable biomass could produce about one-third of the current demand for transportation fuels by 2030. But only if we have the conversion technologies available to convert that product, uh, convert that feedstock into a, a renewable uh, endpoint. And so to do that, what you need is this integrated pipeline to take advantage of the nat natural terrestrial biomass feedstocks and by this, we're talking about agricultural residues, hard softwoods, dedicated energy grasses. We're not talking about corn, and we're not necessarily talking about ethanol. At the place I work, we have a, several mantras that guide us in the day-to-day -day operations. First and foremost of those is that ethanol is for drinking and not for driving. And so what we're looking at is how can we take these natural feedstocks and convert them into drop-in replacement fuels for gasoline, diesel, and aviation. That's really where you get the impact. Because then you're not talking about the infrastructure concerns, you're not talking about a trillion dollars to distribute a new product, you're utilizing the existing infrastructure uh, to make those fuels happen. But first you need to have the supply of those feedstocks, you need to really make the sugars from them, and then you need to convert them into those drop-in chemicals and fuels. And I'll highlight some of the examples here, but uh, really quickly, not all of these examples, take a deep breath, and I've only got 51 seconds left, so it's almost over. Uh, but I want, wanted just to highlight that this is a central metabolic map uh, in E. coli that demonstrates the variety of products that are produced naturally. And so the question is not what can we produce, but what should we produce? And so what we really want is BioShack, right? Another message I want to convey to you is that we really want to establish a BioShack where we can uh, assemble our motherboards and our refineries uh, in a very systematic fashion. And one of the first examples that we did at the Joint Bioenergy Institute is make E. coli that could secrete biodiesel in the form of these fatty acid ethyl esters. And we did that by a relatively simple process of knocking out one enzyme and overexpressing the production of these fatty acid ethyl esters. Okay, I was wondering what was everybody applauding for. We're also doing methyl ketones in E. coli uh, as another diesel surrogate. 
Um, and I also just wanted to end with that there are other projects related to renewable energy in the Bay Area that are great. And they represent the whole full spectrum of solutions. And thank you very much. That was excellent, excellent start. So do we have any uh, folks who need to be seated now on this break? Is anyone waiting out there? No, okay. All right, so next up is Andrilla Mukapadie, who is going to speak about a different kind of microbe or a different use of microbes. Please come up. I work at the Joint Bioenergy Institute also. I'm a staff scientist at the Berkeley Lab, and I'm gonna tell you uh, some more about microbes. Now that last talk was a great example of how microbes um, are part of these core technologies that are being developed uh, to meet some of the broadest demands of our times and the demands that we are making on our planet. But um, in, in my talk, I'm going to talk about a slightly different kind of microbes, and I'm going to open with a very familiar image. This is an image from the 2010 Gulf oil spill. It's possibly one of the biggest man-made disasters. And for weeks afterwards, we thought we had destroyed that entire ecosystem. And we actually had no clue about how to mitigate this problem. Now, a couple of years later, much of that oil is gone. And a very powerful metabolism of this organism that exists in that environment had, to lo had a lot to do with uh, mitigation of this, of this um, disaster. Alcanivorax borcumensis is a very famous microbe now. And there are a lot of people studying it trying to understand why it does what it does and when it will do what it does. But this is hardly the only organism that is our secret friend in the environment. So I'm showing you some images from Arizona from 2012, last year, where there were these horrible dust storms, completely brought life to a standstill for a lot of people. And this primarily happened because we destroyed this beautiful, elegant cyanobacteria that form um, these mantles over the desert holding it down. These are biological soil crusts. They were alive, and we did a lot of damage in the desert causing these dust storms. You don't even have to go that far. Every protein in all your bodies and every organism that you know of contains at least one sulfur atom. And the sulfur is made available to us by the biological activity of these little microbes, such as Desulfovibrio vulgaris. Vulgaris is the Latin for common. They are very, very common. They're all over the place. And their, their role in our lives is un, um, uncontroversial. The same chemistry that Desulfovibrio uses to confer uh, to convert sulfates to sulfide is the chemistry one would use to convert heavy metals from its oxidized states, where it's soluble in water, to its reduced form, where it's no long, longer soluble in water. And why is this important? Because it allows you to biocontain this very, very toxic waste that we generate in our energy and nuclear and um, industrial practices. And it has profound implications on how we can mitigate damage in our environment and how we can live in harmony with our environments. So we've gotten very good. We've gotten very good at identifying who our friends are. But can we always understand what they will do and can we predict how they will behave in these environments? The environment is a very, very complex place with a lot of different parameters that are dictating the behavior of these organisms. The organisms are not much simpler either. I'm showing you a little schematic of a very small part of desulfovibrio, and it's already pretty complicated. So you're at a place where you're trying to predict all these complicated parameters coming together and cross-secting with your microbe, and you're trying to figure out how they operate. Can we really do that? Do we know when they will behave the way that we want them to behave? Well, survival in the environment, perceiving signals, is not something that only microbes do. We do it too, every day. That's why our species is here today. 
And at the end of the day, these parameters, these stimuli from our environment, being able to see, hear, touch our environments and, and respond in the correct matter, manner boils down to molecular me mechanisms. Um, and that is not much different for microbes either. They too have signaling systems that tells them what is happening in the environment so that they can figure out how their response would give them the fitness that they need to survive that environment. Just that in the case of microbes, it's a little bit immediate. They don't have the hierarchy of sophisticated vision or hearing mechanisms. It's very immediate. They have to see the signal and they have to come up with the response immediately. Most microbes have signaling systems that basically um, are present on the, on the cell surface that they use to sense these, to sense their external stimuli and then um, orchestrate their response. And their response is going to be sort of an aggregate of all the, of all the stimuli that they are um, perceiving. So that's good. We know a lot about these signaling systems and a lot of pathogenic bacteria because we've been studying them for a long time. But what about these environmental bacteria? Do we know? Do we know anything about them? Well, to give you an example of D. vibrio vulgaris, my favorite organism, it was discovered in 1940, uh, maybe 30 years before I was born. Its genome sequence has been known for the last 10 years. And astoundingly, even though, it is the, even though it is the focus of a lot of different studies that focus on understanding how it will respond in the environment, applications designed around its activity, its signaling systems, until very recently, were completely unknown. So this is the knowledge gap that we are trying to bridge here. This is the, the gap in knowing what it can do and what it will do to be able to predict this is, is the thought of the day. Um, any one of these signaling systems, any one of them could be something someone like me could study my entire life and still not understand fully. So we simply don't have to have the time to study them one at a time. So what we did is we devised a strategy to figure out as much as we could about these signaling systems in one fell swoop. And in two years, we managed to predict all the genes that are controlled by all the signaling systems in the sulfovibrio. What that does it is gives us connection between the environment and this organism. We can now know that the carbon utilization of this organism relies not only on the ability of this organism to sense whether carbon is present or not, but also on nitrate stress, phosphate stress, oxidative stress, and two other unknown stresses we quite haven't figured out yet. What this gives us is an ability to know what the environment means to this organism. What is the connection? How does it see its, en its environment? And when something dramatic changes in that environment, how will it respond? Now, in our, in our lives and in our beliefs, we always talk about living in harmony with our environment. As our demands on our planets increase exponentially, it's very important that we understand how we can, how our secret allies are in the environment are behaving so as to be able to predict their response. And of course, since I didn't do this work alone, um, this is my team, and thank you very much. <laughs>
And this is an idea that in thinking about the brain, we, you know, we, we, don't really, uh, we, we don't really think it's possible. But I'm going to show you that over the last 10 years, we've had a really different way of thinking about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and through advances in molecular biology and imaging, we sort of have the ability to, to start thinking about pr preventing it before it happens. So <clears throat> before I get into this too far, I just want to make sure we, we're on the same page. Dementia. Uh, is a term that is sort of a global term for progressive loss of cognitive ability. And Alzheimer's disease is a one cause of dementia. It's the disease that's the most common cause of dementia. And I think many of you know that it, it begins usually with memory loss. And of course, all of us uh, are worried about that because we're all forgetting things all the time. So <clears throat> when we look at the brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease, this is a photomicrograph that shows you the plaque and the tangle. And there are two kinds of abnormalities here. There's the amyloid plaque, or made of this protein called A-beta, which is this big, dense, gooey protein that kind of uh, aggregates in the brain. And then there's the tau, made out of an, uh, the neurofibrillary tangle here, uh, which is made out of a protein called tau. And we have this plaque protein and the tau protein, and they exist in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease. And by studying transgenic animals and patients over the course of the last 20 years, we've elucidated sort of a pathway by which these proteins get deposited in the brain. And the amyloid protein is actually cleaved. So this is the A-beta amyloid protein that's cleaved from this much larger protein by these two enzymes called beta and gamma secretase. And when they cleave this protein, the amyloid floats off into the brain and forms these plaques. And we think that these plaques may then subsequently actually precipitate the development of this neurofibrillary tangle. So there's a lot of evidence that this A-beta plaque if it's not the cause of Alzheimer's disease, and we don't really know what the cause is, but if it's not the cause, it's at least a very, very early event in the, in the formation of this particular disease, in the pathogenesis of the disease. So we can now image this amyloid protein in the brain, and this is really the most remarkable development in my career. Um, this is, uh, the, 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 the way this technique came about was by starting with this dye called thioflavin T. And this thioflavin T could be used in tissue sections, just like the one I just showed you, to stain the amyloid protein so you could see it under the microscope. So this is a microscope slide showing you the amyloid plaques stained with this thioflavin T dye. Well, theoretically, all you would have to do would be to figure out a way to visualize this particular dye when it's injected in the brain, in, into, the, into the blood vessels of a person. It would circulate around, just a very simple injection. Uh, but it really was a very complicated problem, and a couple of guys uh, in Pittsburgh, actually, worked this, worked this uh, process out. And they figured out that they could label this with a carbon-11, which was a positron-emitting radioisotope. We have a cyclotron in Berkeley that we can use to make things like this. Carbon-11 has a 20-minute half-life. So what we do in my lab is we make this carbon-11 labeled compound, inject it into a person, and then we can image the brain and actually see the amount of amyloid. So we've taken this molecule that's a dye and engineered it so that it gets into the brain with a simple injection, a very low dose of radioactivity to individuals, and we can actually see this amyloid protein in the brain. And this is an example of an MRI scan uh, and an amyloid image scan shown, on, shown superimposed on each other. And this red is the area of the brain where the amyloid is, is deposited. And what's remarkable about this particular image is it comes from a normal older person. This is a person who doesn't have symptoms. It's a person who doesn't complain of memory loss, who tests completely normally on memory tests. In fact, this is a volunteer from the Berkeley community. I'm going to tell you, maybe one of you. Uh, I hope not. Uh, but we don't actually know what this means. We don't know that this means this person will develop Alzheimer's disease. All we know is that this person has this amyloid in the brain. Uh, but we think it's a risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. And as I said, it turns out that about 30% of uh, healthy older people uh, in their 70s or 80s uh, will have a, a brain scan that looks like this. So by studying people, uh, who are healthy and following them over time and doing other kinds of scans like MRI scans and all, all kinds of other imaging studies, we've kind of formed a view of, of, of the idea that Alzheimer's disease, uh, the amyloid is there for a long time before symptoms occur. And we think it begins with this amyloid uh, in the brain and then it develops on 
to showing degeneration of the brain where we start to see these changes like we talked about with the tau pathology and the tangles. We start to see evidence of functional change and we can detect that in other kinds of brain scans. And it's only after a long time, we think probably 15 or 20 years, that we end up uh, with individuals who develop decline in their thinking abilities and dementia. So this is a long process and in between uh, we have these other abnormalities that we think the amyloid provokes. Okay, so, so far, that's all bad news, isn't it? <clears throat> well, let's go back to this model. And what you're, you remember is that this amyloid protein is cleaved by, by these beta and gamma secretases, and now we can actually develop drugs that target various aspects of this. And so, a number of uh, different laboratories and companies uh, have developed these approaches. One is where we use antibodies to actually lower the amyloid in the brain. Uh, the other is where we use uh, enzyme inhibitors that actually block these secretase enzymes and prevent this A-beta from being cut from the larger molecule in the first place. So in theory, we can use these approaches. Now they've been tried in people with Alzheimer's disease. And here's an example of a study uh, that was published a, a few years ago where they gave uh, Alzheimer's disease patients this drug uh, called bapinuzumab. Say that 10 times fast. Uh, they gave this drug, bapinuzumab, which is an antibody that lowers amyloid. So did it work? Did it lower amyloid? Well, here's two, in, two individual people. Uh, this is a baseline scan, and this is a scan after treatment, and you can see the amyloid has gone down in the image, and here the amyloid has gone from this to this. So the amyloid seems like it's been lowered in contrast to the individual on placebo. But don't take two images uh, for it. Uh, here's the aggregate data that shows the placebo group is sort of going up and the, and the uh, drug group is going down. So it lowered amyloid, but they didn't get any better. And the reason they didn't get any better, we think, is because by the time people get Alzheimer's disease, their brain has been seriously damaged and seriously ravaged. And so the approach now is to identify people before they get sick and treat them with the drug. So the idea is to assess people for their risk, maybe their age is good enough, maybe genetics, do the amyloid PET scan, select individuals based on an amyloid scan who would be tried, who would be tested on amyloid with amyloid lowering drugs, and then see if these amyloid lowering drugs have an effect and we can monitor the effects with this amyloid therapy. And uh, these are the folks who've contributed to my research by participating. So I sense a weakening resolve at the 7.45 mark, so you sort of you don't want to interrupt these people. Uh, so next up, a change of pace, uh, Greg Bell, the next presenter, he'll be talking about scientific networking and big data. Greg. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Hello, thanks. So my idea is that um, big data is going to transform scientific discovery. You may have heard about big data and you may have wondered exactly what that means. So let's start with an example, and this is not in a scientific context, it's more in an ordinary context. Imagine you come across a postcard, an older postcard, it has this image on it, an old photo, with no attribution information at all. You have no idea where this was taken, but you'd like to find out. What strategy could you adopt to find that out? Well, you could carry the postcard with you every day and you could show it to all your friends and you could ask if they know where it was taken. That might or might not work. Um, or you could use the internet. Uh, there's a new, actually there's a new service, I think it's a little known, a Google service called um, Search by Image. And it lets you take an image that Google's never seen before and upload it to the website. And I did that just a couple days ago with this image, which I happen to have taken on vacation. I uploaded it to Google, and Google thought about it for about a third of a second, and it produced an amazing amount of information. It told me what city that was, it was taken in, Istanbul, what structure it was taken in, and, and what room within the structure it was taken in. Then it provided me with six or eight images that were visually similar, many of which were taken in the same room, and one of which is almost identical to the image that I uploaded. It was taken by a different tourist on a different day with a different camera, uh, and it was posted in a Brazilian website. So this is pretty amazing. It, it looks like something of a, of a miracle, and, but behind the scenes there's a lot of infrastructure and capabilities that make this possible. For one, Google owns a global network of massive data centers. This is their data center outside of Atlanta. 
stuffed full of high performance computers and storage and high performance networking. And then there's a small army of experts, applied mathematicians and computer programmers, computational scientists, experts in computer vision. And all this together forms a kind of environment for discovery. And that's what we mean by big data. The data itself is at the center of that environment. And the fact that it's big may not even be the most challenging thing about it. Sometimes it's challenging because it's complex or it's heterogeneous or it's very noisy. But that data sits at the center and all these other capabilities I talked about um, are combined into a larger discovery environment that lets us answer questions we couldn't answer before. Now this is what Google is doing, it's what Facebook and Netflix and Amazon are all doing, and increasingly it is what scientists are doing. And in fact, many scientific fields have been transformed or are in the process of being transformed by this big data paradigm, and climate modeling is a good example. Another, um, there are a number of examples in high energy physics as well, and in fact the, the amazing announcement last summer about discovery for evidence of the Higgs boson that you may have heard about and Berkeley Lab played a big role in that, um, was, there was, was a triumph of big data analysis. And one way to visualize the impact of big data on the sciences is actually to look at computer networks where all the, data, all the data has to cross the networks to get from one location to another. And you might be surprised to learn that Berkeley Lab manages a very large scale computer network. It's the fastest science network in the world. It interconnects all the national labs at national scale. And if you look at the history of data on that network, which is called the Energy Sciences Network, or ESNet, it's really skyrocketing. And that's the impact of big data science. And just a tiny digression on networking, because I manage the Energy Sciences Network, I want to say that these big data flows we describe as elephants, because they are a million times or maybe 10 million times larger than the more ordinary flows that you and I generate when we check our email, or we browse the web, or we use YouTube, we refer to those as mice. And it turns out the mice and the elephants in this realm, as in the natural realm, uh, at least mythically, they don't inter interact very well in the computer networking realm. And in particular, the mice are, are disturb the elephants. The elephants are very sensitive. So we have to build sort of fast lanes for the elephants in our network that can accommodate the big data flows and make sure they can flow at maximum speed. Okay, so where is all this data coming from? A lot of it is coming from massive scientific instruments. This is a picture of the Atlas detector at CERN, and it's one of the two instruments responsible for, the for collecting evidence that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson. And it is one of the largest and most complex and expensive scientific instruments ever built, and it, it, it produces a lot of big data. Here's another instrument. This one's just on the drawing boards. It hasn't even been built yet. It's a distributed radio telescope called the Square Kilometer Array, and it will be built in Australia and in Southern Africa. And it has hundreds and hundreds of dishes and sensor arrays, and the data that's coming from those parts together adds up to much more data than can be carried today by the gl entire global internet. In fact, 100 times more. So some of these big instruments are truly producing just a massive amounts of data. But in addition to that, smaller instruments are beginning to produce a lot of data. So small environmental or weather sensors or, or desktop DNA sequencers or medical imaging devices or little individual t detectors that are part of larger facilities, they're all producing a lot of data. Um, and that, that is truly transforming scientific discovery. So back to this picture. Um, you may wonder, how do scientists interact productively with all this data? Is there a tool like Google that enables them to short circuit a lot of painful manual uh, analysis and generate sort of leaps of insight quickly? And the answer is that yes, those tools are being developed. Some of them are being developed at Berkeley Lab or with close participation at Berkeley Lab. And I'll tell you about just a couple of them briefly. Um, both of the ones I'm going to tell you about, you can Google and learn about, and I think you can access them online and get your own accounts and interact with them, actually. So they're, they're, they're to some extent, public tools. This one is called the Materials Project. It's a tool for materials sciences, scientists, and it lets them, um, materials scientists can use this tool to find new compounds and better compounds for building uh, new batteries or solar cells or many, many other devices. And they don't need to do that experimentally. They don't need to do it by building or synthesizing the compounds in the lab. They can do it computationally. And this has a couple of advantages. It can, it can speed up their work a lot. And it also holds the promise of being, being able to let them do things they would never imagine doing in the lab. Here's another example. Um, this is called the, the knowledge base, or K-base, for predictive biology. This is quite an interesting tool because it brings together over 900 separate data sets. 
um, into a very rich environment that scientists can use for interacting with the data. This is only one tool, the sort of pathways tool of a, a couple of dozen that KBase provides. And this tool lets scientists um, pose questions about and explore the, the structure and function of proteins and genes. Okay, I want to close with, with one final idea, which is that Berkeley Lab is really a world pioneer in harnessing big data for science. And that's, I think, because we have most of the ingredients required to create that environment for discovery. So we've got lots of instruments, big and small, that produce a lot of data. We've got one of the world's um, foremost computational centers, NERSC Supercomputing Center, currently at Oakland, moving soon back uphill to Berkeley. And the importance of NERSC is not just that it's got, um, you know, a top five supercomputer, but it's got lots of experts and staff expert in making that computer useful in a scientific context. We've got an amazing array of applied mathematicians, computational scientists, programmers. Um, we've got the world's fastest science network, and then remarkable domain scientists, physicists, biologists, chemists, like the people I'm sharing the stage with. And together, this creates um, a really productive environment for discovery around big data. So in closing, the big idea is big data will transform science, and it's happening at Berkeley Lab today. Thank you. So apart from beating the clock, we just give an extra round of applause, you'll note in Greg's presentation how many times he said Berkeley Lab. And that's a very conscious decision on our part because uh, Berkeley Lab is a name that we're using a lot these days and we're doing it uh, for, uh, well, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is to distinguish ourselves from our other institution that's a little farther east from us because we found that a lot of people don't know that Berkeley Lab even exists. So that's the name we're using. You're going to hear a lot of it uh, for many months to come. So uh, next presenter will be uh, David Schlegel, who's going to talk to us about the mysteries of the universe. And I don't need this mic because I have another kind. OK, great. So uh, all the elements in the universe Uh, well, I was just going to say all the elements in the universe were generated in about the first three minutes, so I should be able to do this in eight minutes, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about mapping the universe. So this is the big idea. It's not a new idea. It's something that we've been doing as long as humanity can. Um, but making these maps of the universe, we've actually learned a lot about, well, the universe, obviously, but the components of the universe and the physical laws of the universe. And as an example here, I've put up here a picture of the solar system. Just to illustrate a, as an example, in 1846, the discovery of the planet Neptune was predicted by making maps of the solar system where it just didn't fit the laws of nature that we knew. So we knew either those laws of nature were wrong or there was a new body out there, and that was Neptune. That's how that was discovered. Um, more recently, uh, fast forward 100 years, uh, was the discovery of dark matter also from maps of the universe that didn't fit. So this is material in the universe that's not made out of the protons and neutrons uh, and electrons that form up most of what you're familiar with, but five times more common is this dark matter discovered again by maps of the universe that just didn't fit. Now, in 1998, there was the discovery of dark energy, which is more common than matter or dark matter. Again, maps of the universe that didn't fit. Okay, so what do I mean when I say a map of the universe? Well, here, this is if you just take a picture of the sky. Okay, so this is a picture of the sky from the Hubble Space, Space Telescope. Uh, what you see here are stars and galaxies. Uh, but this is a 2D projection of the sky. So this is what's easy to map out. But you look at this picture, and you can't actually tell some of these objects, they're only a few light years away, they're stars. Some of these objects are about 11 billion light years away, so near the observable edge of the universe. And it's really hard to tell from this picture which is which. So not a very good map, I would say. To make a good map, meaning a three-dimensional map, we need to take what we call spectra, where we take these pictures of the sky and then we take the light from each one of these objects and split it up into the constituent wavelengths of the light. 
And then that gives us enough information that we can then determine um, what each object is composed of and how far away it is in the universe. And from this, then we construct a 3D map. Okay. Um, but uh, there are a lot of photons coming from the universe. So these maps, if you look up in the sky, in the previous image, there are about 100 billion galaxies that you could see over the sky. Uh, each one of those galaxies has uh, hundreds of billions of stars. And then they're um, radiating photons to us on Earth. Now this picture here is just to demonstrate what you could do if you could build the perfect detector for all these uh, photons from distant galaxies. So this is if you just go up to um, kind of a quiet mountaintop somewhere up in Tilden Park, laid down on the ground, and I'd suggest doing this on a moonless night where you're not being contaminated by all the uh, reflected light from the sun. Um, if you did that for a whole night, then there are enough photons, enough light particles hitting your body from all those distant galaxies that you would get enough information to actually construct a 3D map of all of those objects. Well, actually, so I should say, you'd have to do this at least two nights, okay? So you'd do that tonight, and then you should come back in six months when the Earth moved to a different part in the solar system and then make the rest of the sky. And you should also go to the South Pole maybe for a night. <laughs> okay, so that would be the perfect detector if you could turn your body into the perfect detector. Uh, we don't have that yet, I wish we did. Um, but we, what we have then are telescopes like, here's the Hubble Space Telescope. It turns out this is not a very good instrument for making these maps of the whole universe. And the reason is this telescope can only see a tiny bit of the sky at once. So it's the field of view that it can see on the sky. It's about the same as if you take uh, an eight foot long soda straw and look through it. And then you can move the position of that soda straw every hour and a half. Um, and you can work it out. Then it takes you about, uh, yes, 200,000 years to try to map the sky. So that's not the right answer. Um, so what we've done is we've built a special purpose telescope. This is an Apache Point, New Mexico, where we can see a larger patch of the sky at once. So this can see a patch of sky about 40 times larger than the full moon. Uh, and instead of looking at one object at a time, this telescope can look at 1,000 objects at a time. And we do this by taking fiber optic cables and then plugging them into the positions of a thousand different galaxies at once, and then we observe those for an hour, uh, and then move the telescope and map a different part of the sky. So this little movie here was someone plugging in all these fibers. Unfortunately, they don't actually move quite that fast. That was in fast forward. Okay, so this has been a great way to map the universe, where over the last five years now, we've mapped the three-dimensional positions of one and a half million galaxies. So this is the premier instrument on the planet right now for making these maps. That's how quickly we can go. So the future is uh, taking that person out of the loop and replacing that with robots that can actually reconfigure uh, the focal plane of telescopes much more quickly. Uh, so what we have here is something we're designing right now at Berkeley Lab, where on the back of a large telescope we'll have 5,000 uh, little robots, each one the size of my thumb, reconfiguring things on the focal plane of this telescope in 60 seconds. And then every 15 minutes, we can point to a different part of the universe. And then this map I was showing you that we've uh, painfully constructed over the last five years, we'll be able to do that in 10 nights. Okay, then once we finish this, uh, well, I should say, so far, we've only mapped uh, about half a percent of the observable universe. I think I have that here somewhere. Yes, here we go. So this is the map of the universe that we've constructed so far. And for those of you who's, who's already bought tickets for Star Trek on Thursday night. Okay, 
they'll show something like this in somewhere in that movie, uh, but it differs from this in the notable way that this is the real universe that you actually live in. And I'll stop there. Thank you, David. Uh, so our next presenter will be Ron Zuckerman, who's going to be talking to us about mimicking nature. Ron? Thank you. So um, <clears throat> let's move now from the expanses of the universe down to the fundamental building blocks of life. <clears throat> so it turns out that the building blocks of life, primarily nucleic acids, proteins, and sugars, um, all share one thing in common, and that is their polymers. <clears throat> so polymers, we think of something like paint or glue or plastics. Um, but in biology, polymers do much more interesting things. Nucleic acids store the information of life. Proteins are the machinery of life. And sugars are sort of the energy source of life. <clears throat> so as a material scientist, I look at this and say, you know, gee, what's up with this polymer thing? Um, and, and furthermore, what is a polymer? And a polymer is a particular structure. It's a, it's a linear chain of building blocks strung together like beads on a string. And so why does nature use that type of architecture? And the answer is, I think, is pretty simple. Um, and that is, it's about a simple set of building blocks. It's very efficient to build stuff from a common set of building blocks. And so here I'm showing the 20 amino acids that represent all the, the, all the building blocks you need to make any protein in our body. And the way that nature does this is by stringing them together in a particular sequence. So it's the actual order of monomers in the chain that determines a protein's shape and its function. And uh, essentially, you can think of the sequence as folding instructions that tell the chain how to adopt a particular structure. And so here, I'm just showing some of my favorite protein structures, um, like silk is one. This is a viral capsid. Proteins also do um, interesting things, like bind very specifically, like myoglobin binds oxygen. Here's a DNA binding protein. Uh, and proteins also catalyze chemical transformations. So as a material scientist, we want to learn from this, this blueprint set from nature and understand how to build synthetic materials that are much more stable and rugged and we could use in industrial processes and as sensors and that kind of thing. So um, <clears throat> what we need to understand then is the relationship of the sequence of monomers to structures like these. And so I liken this to origami. Origami, you take a common starting material, a piece of paper, and by providing very specific instructions, you can achieve all kinds of different shapes, OK? So the key is, I mean, if you've tried this, it's actually pretty hard. <laughs> The key is understanding these folding instructions. Um, and so that's what I'm doing uh, in my research. So here is the chemical structure of a protein, just a short chunk of it we call a peptide. And in my research, um, <clears throat> here I'm showing the uh, amino acid building blocks. These are all linked together one after the other. And what I invented in my lab are molecules that are very similar but totally synthetic. These are called peptoids. And the cool thing about peptoids, here's the <coughs> unnatural amino acid unit. These are not degraded by uh, enzymes, so they're much more rugged and stable. So the question is, how do we um, link these together? How can we make materials out of them? The, another neat thing is the chemistry we developed uh, is amenable to using all kinds of different shapes and sizes of these so-called R groups, or the side chains. And we developed um, synthesis uh, methods that, um, where we use robots to link these units together. So here, um, showing a addition of one of these beads along the chain. Um, <coughs> and we can make all kinds of different sequences in parallel and then evaluate which ones work the best. 
So here we're adding uh, one monomer, here's another monomer, and we can do parallel reaction. It takes about an hour to add each building block, and so we can, it takes time, and, uh, but you can do it while, the robot can do it while you're home sleeping. So, <coughs> what do we make? Well, so we need to learn from biology. So here's uh, an example, a beautiful protein called green fluorescent protein. It's from jellyfish, it actually glows green. And we can learn from this by looking at it through special set of glasses, which um, I will simulate for you. If we consider the building blocks that make up this protein, uh, if we look at this through, a, through special glasses that only show you amino acids that like water and amino acids that don't like water. So this idea of oil and water separating from one another is one of the fundamental things. So when we look at it that way, you can see some interesting patterns. So red is hydrophilic, that means it likes to be in contact with water, and yellow is hydrophobic, that means it hates water. And what you'll see is this striping pattern. And what that does, that sort of sequence arrangement, you'll notice puts all the yellow groups in the inside and all the red groups on the outside. And it makes sense, these proteins exist in water, uh, these what other way can you hide from water except by clustering into the inside? So we applied this rule to non-natural peptoids. So here I'm just showing the chemical structure where the yellow is the hydrophobic group and the red is the hydrophilic group. So this is, I would call this a two-fold repeating pattern. So we made synthetic peptoids with the same exact pattern uh, and asked, well, what's it gonna do? What's it gonna fold into? Uh, and to our surprise, we're not expecting this kind of thing, but we end up making what we now call nanosheets, very highly ordered material, these very sharp edges, very surprising that uh, these polymers are very flexible, like cooked spaghetti, and yet somehow um, they recognize each other and form very ordered material. Um, this is a little bit harder to see, but you can see, uh, you can see these by uh, optical microscopy. They're, up to about a tenth of a millimeter in size. It's, it's pretty large. Um, and so here I'm highlighting one nanosheet. And we're wondering, okay, what is, the, what is the structure of this material? And what can we learn from what we synthesize? And we find that the peptoid chains actually stack up in this brick-like pattern. And they stretch out and when they meet their neighbors and make these like floorboards, uh, this highly ordered uh, structure. And so this section of sheet is actually about 800 million peptoids lined up next to each other. And how do we know that? <clears throat> we can see that, so up at Berkeley Lab, we have uh, some of the most powerful electron microscopes in the world. This is at the National Center of Electron Microscopy. And here you can see individual peptoid chains running parallel to each other. Uh, this is the very edge of a sheet. And, <clears throat> okay, so let me just wrap up by saying um, it makes sense to hide all these hydrophobic groups in the center. And um, the last thing is um, this is a movie now that we're employing, we're getting our supercomputers and our theory colleagues together to look at actually how these form and use this to engineer future uh, advanced materials. So thank you. Nice. Did you see now? But wait, wait, wait. So, uh, our last presenter is the uh, legendary cancer researcher, Mina Bissell, and she's asked for some additional time. <laughs> All right, but wait, but wait. She says tomorrow is her birthday. So, what do you think? Should we give her a little extra time? Okay, we'll do so. Mina, welcome. Um, a number of you have heard me. I'm the fourth time in this stage. And of course, 30 years coming to Berkeley Rep. Now, I um, did not ask for more time. They gave me more time. 
But I thought I'd give you, <laughs> I'd give them an excuse to allow me to do this because I gave a talk, it's known as a TED talk, and some of you probably have seen it, it's about 16 minutes. I'm going to do it really fast and see how many minutes I can cut. Okay, now. So, the dominant theory, oh my goodness, what happened to my previous slide? What? Yeah, oh, all right, never mind. You see, I should have come and looked at it. So uh, this is all messed up, and I have, this is not the talk that I was going to give you with that order, but since I'm so used to being on the stage, I am not going to panic, and I'm still going to tell you something very important about the first lesson that I like to give physicists about biology. And that one it starts like this. When your mom and dad meet, and some of you have seen this, you have an egg and a sperm. And you know why we have so many sperms per one egg? Because the guys never know how to ask for direction. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the sperm, one of them finally hits the egg. It's now a fertilized egg. It becomes like this, it becomes like that, and before you know it, it becomes like that. <laughs> now, imagine how many cells this woman has in her body. She came from a single cell with the same genetic information. And she has, does anybody want to guess? 10 to 70 trillion cells in her body. And these are more than the national debt of US and Europe put together. <laughs> Imagine, they all have the same, the same genetic information. Now, have you ever thought about what 70,000 cells look like? The number 70,000? It goes and goes and goes, and this is not doing any of the things I expected it to do. So you have to watch my TED talk. <laughs> so we decided that it is really important to find out, it, it actually, after my old age, you know, I have been doing science for 40 years. This tells me I can never take anything for granted. I should have actually gone and looked at their slides. My assistants send the slides and they're all scrambled. So what can I say? All right, here is a human breast. We ask the question of how does this 70 trillion cell, all with the same genes, make your nose, make your finger, make your breast, and for the gentleman to listen, make the prostate. So how do they do it? And we decided that we really know nothing about this. And what we are going to do is we are going to have to make a model we chose the mammary gland, that's actually a picture of the human mammary gland, and this is this beautiful three-dimensional uh, structure of one of these things in the human breast, and around it are fat, but we have about seven or eight of these, and we decided that even that was too complicated, um, and what we are going to really concentrate on is to concentrate on what we call an asinus, which is what the mammary gland makes when animal gets pregnant. You have one layer of beautiful epithelial cells, one layer of what we call myoepithelial cells, and then around it, what we have, what we have is something that I knew nothing about and I had to learn about. It. So we have over the years, my goodness, over the years, asked the question, what actually makes a breast breast and why, when you take the cells out of the breast and you put them in the dish, why do they forget where they came from? So here is a picture of a single mammary gland or breast from human breast. You see how beautiful it is? It has very lovely structure. It has a bottom, it has a top, it has a secretory activity. You take these cells and you put them in the dish, in about two days, every one of them forget. They were making gobs and gobs of milk. 
They had fat droplets. They were making the milk coming out. They were doing all sorts of wonderful things. They are polar. They have a bottom. They have a top. And these forget. So it says that the cells, once a nose or once a breast or once a prostate, don't always remain a nose or a prostate. So the question is, what actually gives them the information? What makes them do this, right? So you look, for example, at the nuclei of these. You see this is in the dish. This is in, in vivo. You put these things in the dish, they forget to make milk. So we ask the question, why is that? So if we do a section of the mammary gland of the mouse, we see that around these acetals is this red stuff which is called extracellular matrix. And these extracellular matrix components are like collagen, huge molecule. People believe that these things actually give you structure and they don't have information and signaling. And I decided that because they lose it, maybe what the cells didn't have in a tissue culture dish was actually this material. So we actually put and found a material that we were able to put these cells in that material. They could bring it around themselves. They could make a three-dimensional structure. In animals, they look like this. In 3D culture, they look like this. And once they find their three-dimensional architecture in this gelatinous extracellular matrix gel, they now are remembering, hey, I'm a mammary gland, I'm a breast, I know what to do. So we believe that the basis of organ specificity in all of you, when you look at yourself as a miracle in the mirror, is the architecture of that organ. There is wisdom in your nose, there is wisdom in your liver, there is wisdom in your breast, and it all comes from the architecture. Now we can make these gorgeous looking thing full of milk inside this three-dimensional structure. And you can imagine, I had a picture of me when I had one of these big birthdays with a big mustache of milk, saying, we got milk. OK. <laughs> so we can make these lovely structures of human or mouse breast. And we can do all sorts of other things. This was supposed in the beginning of my talk, and it has come now, so I'm not going to pay attention to it, only to tell you that that's one of the most clear examples of why when people get cancer and everybody tells you that they have had a single cancer gene that is going awry and is giving them all these cancer is not correct. You take a cancer gene, this famous, famous virus, you can put it in the chicken and it gives you that tumor, that ugly tumor, you put it in the embryo, which we did. Here it is in this beautiful feather with these blue things, and it turns into a feather. It just finds a different home. So it says that the context in which a cell finds itself is absolutely dominant over your genome. So your genome is not necessarily your destiny. It's a lot of your destiny when you're born. But once you're born, the microenvironment of those genes are dominant over the phenotype. This is really a pity, though. So we made a hypothesis. We said if this architecture is, in fact, the most important thing that happens, we should be able to take a cancer cell, give it the right context, and they should think they are normal. Alternatively, we could take a mouse, destroy the structure without giving them a cancer gene, and they should become tumorigenic. And we have done both of these, and I don't have very much time to tell you except to show you. Here are the non-malignant cells in, in an assay or in an uh, experiment that we have developed where they make this beautiful structure. These are the nuclei. This is the cytoskeleton. They make an acinus. Here is malignant cells, and when we took these malignant cells and we measured what was in the surface, we found out that these malignant cells, in fact, did many of the things these do, but they had completely lost the balance of what is at their cell surface. So we took an antibody to one of the um, molecules 
that actually signals to the extracellular matrix and brought the level of that molecule to the level of normal, and look what happened. They all became normal, completely turning the cells into a cell that is a, a structure that is normal. If we put this into the mouse, while these make 100% tumor, the whole structure makes zero tumor. If we dissociate them and put them with this antibody, then they get 70% less tumor and it takes for months before they do it. It was very exciting, as you can imagine. And this is the assay. We have shown and we have done this. And you can see here on the left, every one of those are like hundreds and thousands of human tumors. And on the right, these are tumors that got reverted to a normal phenotype. It's absolutely exciting. All right, so the conclusions are that growth and malignant behavior are regulated at the level of the architecture. And I will tell you that you get Alzheimer because the architecture of the brain starts going. And you get problem with mammary gland or the breast because we age. Aging is the biggest risk factor. So form and function are related dynamically and reciprocally. This was a beautiful thing that was going around like this. I have no idea, Jeff, what happened, but uh, honest to God, oh, there it is, look at it. So form and function are related dynamically and reciprocally. You mess up one, you mess the other, it's like yin and yang, right? All right, so where do we go now? So the thing that for you to remember is that as you are sitting here, in every one of your 70 trillion cells, 70 trillion cells, this is going on. Every cell has to know where they are, and their context has to be correct. They go from in to out and out to in, and I call this the model of dynamic reciprocity. OK, now, look at this. They made this discovery very recently last year where you put one of these things in a gel. This is human breast adult cell. In order to make that structure, we discover the whole new movement. It does this incredible stuff that you just saw. And we have a very beautiful paper that shows that when the normal cells know what to do, the malignant cells don't. But when we revert them, they attach to each other, and they start doing this movement again, so they make the correct scaffold on which we are now able to build that structure again. And this is going to be very important in bioengineering human tissues. So I want to finish by a poem that I love from Yeats. I always um, debated, do I want to be an English major or do I want to be a chemistry major? But at the end, uh, science won, but I love the literature. He says, Ooh. He says, oh, chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer. Never mind. Here is the important thing. How can we tell the dancer from the dance? It's among the school children. How do you tell the dancer from the dance? Here it is, this beautiful Merce Cunningham with whom I took some lessons. And as you see, when he's dancing, he's a dancer. When he stops, He's neither a dancer nor we have a dance. So is with form and function. So is with the structure of your nose and the structure of your mouth and why they don't turn into each other, thank goodness. But at one point, somebody took a cell from a sheep called Dolly, right? It came from a mammary gland. So that cell in the mammary gland had all the information to make all that sheep. So you can imagine that we could one morning get up and have two heads, and thank goodness we don't. But if you, <laughs> so here is my group, and that lovely gal in here was my physicist who discovered that particular movement, and I like to say she was in the right context. She came from Trinidad, and her father was an engineer, her mom was a mathematician, and when she was born, they said, you're going to be a physicist, you're going to be a physicist, you're 
she is a brilliant physicist. And it's not because physicists are that much smarter. We have bad physicists, I know. But she is brilliant. And I have had three other postdocs who were physicists. So context determines everything, including you and me, including how we respond to each other. With apologies to my messed up lecture, I had beautiful pictures that are not even here. Well, this is my favorite uh, cartoon. <laughs> so I used to be the cat, and this was the authorities, right? And the authorities said, don't you dare think outside the box. I couldn't get money. People thought I was crazy. And now I always lecture to the young people and say, always think outside the box. Always think outside the box. You have only one life. Leave it well and do something good. And I'm proud to be a member of Lawrence Berkeley Lab. It's a great place to be in. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be bringing some stools out now and having our presenters join us on stage. So why don't you give them all a round of applause? This is really hard. So thank you all. Please come up. So this will just take a second or two. And again, the microphones for the questions are here and here. So we're going to use these. Do we have a stand for? You know, it doesn't. Thank you. Okay. I think we're bringing out one more mic. And I have this one loose. I don't need it, so I will just give it to you guys. But I have the organ. They do have mics. Okay. Okay, let's start our questions. Looks like we have one right here. Aha. Okay. Uh, first, I've got a question for Blake Simmons uh, about biomass. It will save us energy if we're not, I mean, money if we're not importing a bunch of oil, but if plants and sugar have carbon in them, then um, how is that going to be an advantage in terms of climate change if we're just burning fuels that are made from things that have carbon in them? And then another really quick question for Bill Jagast. How can I sign up for a clinical trial to get a PET scan <laughs> and repeat and receive treatment to prevent Alzheimer's? I'm I'm ready. <laughs> All right, let's start with the first one, Mr. So, um, first of all, I agree with you. I was going to ask the same question about the PET scan. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity. Uh, but that's a really good question about the carbon balance between what is the current ground state and where we want to go from the renewable economy. And there are many different ways to answer it. But I, I'll just, the bottom line is that we really want to close or establish a zero carbon balance uh, from the renewable sources, gas compared to petroleum uh, and fossil sources. So right now, we pull stuff out of the ground. Uh, it's very economical, it's very cheap, uh, and we burn it, and the carbon goes up into the atmosphere. Uh, and then the, the sink, the process by which you could sequester that carbon and put it back into plants or humans or other uses of it, the, the time interval is really long, right? So what we want to do, or what is proposed, is that uh, we can take these renewable sources of carbon, uh, meaning that they can be generated on a length scale or a time scale that is of interest to humans. Uh, because none of us have billions of years to wait around for planet Earth to do the carbon cycle again for us. So what we want to do is when we take the carbon and we emit it and we burn it, it gets transformed back into plant biomass or algal biomass or something that can be generated over a course of months to years. And then that becomes our source for those chemicals that we burn. And so it's basically closing that carbon loop 
where you have a source term, because we're still going to burn it, but now we have a sync term that is much more rapid and much more efficient than relying on you know, terrestrial ecosystem development. Um, another part of it is by conservation. And that often gets lost in guilt-free America, that we can just keep burning what we want to burn and we'll get better, more efficient engineering from it. So um, lots of people may or may not know that uh, we now have these new fuel efficiency standards uh, that could drive it to 50 miles per gallon uh, on a single gallon of gas. And that has a huge impact on the amount of petroleum and fossil fuels that we would consume for any sector especially the light duty vehicle um, part of the transportation sector. And so when I put that plot up showing that we could produce a billion tons of biomass theoretically and at today's levels of consumption that would be one third of the fossil fuels that we consume for the transportation sector, if we achieve those standards it now becomes a 50 to 60 percent displacement. Because it, it, by that single stroke, by driving better vehicles that are more efficient, improving the engines of tomorrow and designing the fuels for them as well, we can really make a dent in that carbon cycle and make it much better and much easier to attain the greenhouse gas reduction targets that we've established. If we don't, if we just keep burning you know, what we create and keep consuming and growing, uh, and this is a big concern in the developing world and the, and the growing economies, uh, we're never going to be able to make it renewable enough to make an impact. And so it has to be by better engines, better fuels, and better land management to make it all work. Get the second question. Right. I was going to make a joke and ask you to repeat the question, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I remember it uh, because I've gotten it before. So, so uh, a lot of what I told you, um, uh, the work about uh, that whole uh, idea of how to think about Alzheimer's disease, uh, some of that work was done in Berkeley, but um, we're not actually going to be doing this clinical trial in Berkeley, and the clinical trial itself hasn't started. It's going to start up around the United States. Um, at medical centers, uh, and, um, and so there'll be a very large uh, publicity, uh, a large PR campaign at the rollout of this uh, trial. I will tell you that, um, uh, you, you know, th there will be certain criteria, so as I said, about 30 percent of older people have these kind of abnormal scans, so um, we, we estimate that uh, we want to study 1,000 people, so we'll have to scan 3,000 people, and we'll probably have to scan, uh, we'll probably have to screen 5,000 people. So we're not going to, uh, we're going to be looking at people who are most likely to have amyloid uh, in their brain, and that means people who are fairly old, uh, and we may be looking at genetic factors as well. So there'll be a screening process, and then a scanning process, and then people will be put on either a drug or placebo, so it's going to be a clinical trial, so there's a 50% chance that a person would be given a placebo. Uh, and uh, as I said, we, we won't be doing the study in Berkeley, uh, probably be at medical centers in the Bay Area, uh, and it'll be rolling out later this year. Thank Great. you. Thank you for the questions. Next step right here. Yes, for Dr. Bissell. I was wondering if you could say more about the clinical implications and the clinical developments that have been based on what you found about the environment for the cells. Yeah. Can you hear me? Is that on? Yeah. Okay. So one of the big things that I didn't get to elaborate on is the discovery that we have made is that the tumor itself could have a bad genetics, but the microenvironment around the tumor also determines what the tumor does. And one of the reasons we have not succeeded in doing in cancer a lot better than we should, considering that is one of the few areas where we have spent a lot of time and a lot of money, et cetera, is because we have not paid attention to the microenvironment. Because we can show that when we mess up the microenvironment, actually tumor starts growing. And if we can do something good about the microenvironment, we can stop a lot of things. And part of it, of course, is prevention, but the other part of it is to treat both the tumor and the microenvironment. And that's why exercise is so good for you, because people who have tumors and then have had cancer, if they exercise, they get much, much less relapse. The metastasis doesn't occur as often. And also, if we are able to correct and do something with the microenvironment, like stop the inflammatory response of the person who has had it, plus removing the tumor, it does a lot of good. And, and I now stop so other questions could be asked, but at the end of my talk, I can also tell you some other stuff we have done about metastases 
and dormancy, because after all, metastasis is what kills people. And we have a fantastic way of dealing with that now. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions over here? No? No more questions? This is a Berkeley audience. I cannot believe this. Oh. The 2080 theory. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to take uh, yeah, I'll take this question, sure. Well, what I'll tell you, the, the rules that we're working under right now, it's a 70-25-5, which is, <laughs> uh, well, which is basically a statement that right now, as far as we can tell in physics, we're living at the time of maximum ignorance, where 95% is what we know almost nothing about, and that's uh, dark energy and dark matter. and um, really, it's, uh, well, it's just a fascinating time because we have, uh, we can only learn more than what we know right now. <laughs> <laughs> well said. I, I will yes. offer you some microbial relief uh, to that quandary. <laughs> uh, we study a lot of microbial communities uh, in the study for developing renewable fuels. And uh, there are a lot of really stellar performers in converting biomass into sugar or converting the sugars into fuels, but there's a lot of freeloaders that are out there that, that really don't serve any purpose, uh, but they, uh, they still are active participants and they're beneficiaries of it. So that they can call them symbionts or leeches, but now that you bring it up, I am gonna do some statistics on it and see if they really follow the 80-20 rule or if it's, I think it's probably more like 95-5, but uh, it's a good point. <laughs> Thank Give you him your questions. email. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there are all those questions. Now. Yes, we have a question right here. Are the um, engineered um, proteins biodegradable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the ones that we make are not biodegradable, so they, <laughs> they, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they do not degrade. <laughs> However, there are there are a sm there are a number of cases where that's actually really important. So, um, for example, if you want a diagnostic test for a disease, and you want to put a drop of blood on it, <coughs> a lot of the a lot of the things that we normally would think of to use do get degraded, and so they don't last, and they don't make a a reliable, robust test. Or for example, if you want to test um, for toxins, say to give our soldiers that work in really harsh environments like the desert, <clears throat> and you want diagnostic reagents that are really rugged and don't degrade. At least when we say biodegradable, um, we're thinking of short time scales. Of course, all the stuff we're working uh, on is eventually will degrade because it's just made well, of isn't it also important if you are flying on an airplane, you don't want the airplane to biodegrade, <laughs> right? So think about all these things that we don't want to biodegrade per se. But when we put them someplace and let them rust, then we do something else with them. But these guys come up with the materials for things like airplanes. And it's important that it shouldn't be biodegradable. So it's not one single answer to every question. In some cases, it's very important. All those horrible plastic bags are useless. We don't care if they don't become biodegradable. So if you pick up the green ones, they become biodegradable, and that's good. But if you sit in an airplane, you don't want that to happen. <laughs> thank you very much for your question. Do you have another one? Thank you. Um, I'm just saying that if um, you want it to eventually biodegrade, not that you want it to biodegrade immediately. That's that's, true. that's very yes. true. That's, true. that's a good point. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you for raising that. Uh, next question here. You'll make a very good scientist. Yeah, very good. <laughs> now you can come work with me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I had a question for Bill, and that was, um, I was just curious what, whether there was a normal useful function or of the A-beta protein? So the, a, the A-beta protein, uh, remember, is a, sort of a fragment of this much larger protein, and this much larger protein uh, sits in the cell membrane, and uh, there's definitely a, a lot of functions for this larger protein, the precursor protein is called. And that's very important for cells. It's, uh, cells use it to signal one another, uh, to, to tell each other about what they're doing and things, things of that sort. Um, the, the amyloid fragment that is generated doesn't have a clear function, although actually not that long ago it was discovered that it does have, for example, anti, antimicrobial functions. Uh, so it, it, it's not clear what it does, what, what the A-beta protein does normally, but the larger protein certainly is very important. Thanks for the question. Uh, we have one over here. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Schlegel. Uh, if an explanation could be found for the red shift other than constant nonstop ex uh, expansion, would we still need a concept of dark energy and dark matter? So David, we'll be sure to explain the red shift for those who might not know what that right, is. Right, okay, so the, the way that we make these maps of the universe is, uh, all I showed up here was we, I, I said, we take a spectrum of these objects and then we use that to determine the distant of an, a distance of an object. Uh, that's by measuring its redshift or the, the Doppler shift of the light. Um, and then we use that combined with uh, our knowledge that the universe is expanding to then place the uh, objects that are moving more quickly further away. Um, so that's presuming that we can do this mapping of redshift or Doppler shift to distance. Uh, so I, sh I should say, if you go back, um, uh, I mean, uh, at one point, this wasn't well established, but there are many other pieces of in indications showing that uh, the general framework for our picture of the universe is uh, very well understood now. So the fact that we did have the Big Bang, that it was shortly after the Big Bang that the elements formed, that the elements formed in the cooling universe, uh, uh, and then we can see the distant universe actually looks nothing like the universe does today. So if we look at galaxies that we see that are halfway across the universe or three quarters of the way across the universe or even 80% of the way across the universe, we're seeing snapshots of the universe when it was very different, and we can tell that the universe was indeed very much younger then. So that if we look at objects that are at what we say a redshift of two, meaning that the light's been stretched out by factors of several, we can tell that those objects, um, none of them are very old. They're only one or two billion years old as compared to we look locally, and while the sun is five billion years old, and there are other stars near us that are even older than that. Thank you. Next question. Um, this is for Dr. Jagast. In addition to the method that you explained of treating Alzheimer's in which you prevent the cleavage of A-beta, would it also be possible to treat or delay Alzheimer's by adding more adenylcyclase en enzymes or by lowering the breakdown of CAMP? Well, so, <clears throat> so those are signaling pathways uh, within cells. and. Um, uh, it, it's not clear exactly how the amyloid itself does does its toxic damage. So uh, I, I, I guess I can't really answer your question because we don't really know well enough how the amyloid damages the cell. But one of the things that it does, for example, is it affects um, the, the neuron in terms of how the, the synaptic function works and how the signal from the, from at the synapse is sort of um, uh, transduced into the, into the, into the cell. Uh, so Definitely things like cyclic AMP play, play roles in that, but there's really no good solid evidence that that would be a pathway to, to treat for Alzheimer's disease at this point. Thank you for the question. So Andrella, I'm gonna ask one of you. Should we be talking about valley fever and microbes in the soil in the Central Valley? Do you know about that? You know about valley fever? No, I no, don't. No, I don't. Okay, we won't talk about that, sorry. <laughs> That's my Central Valley experience. We have another question here. Would it be possible to, um, to in the 
in a telescope for quickly searching the sky, why not um, have many small telescopes or th like that independently move like a fly's eye? Well, not necessarily independently, but like a wide aperture array. It's a it's a it's a plate, but it can angle in various directions. Right. No. So that's a. That's a very good question. The, the perfect, so again, the perfect detector is if you could take your body and cover it with the Jordi LaForge glasses, right? So that you could detect all the particles hitting your body and the direction that they were hitting your body at, then you'd have that. Then you'd have the perfect detector. You could put that on any collecting area of one telescope or lots of telescopes. Uh, but we don't have that, so we don't have our um, uh, good detectors for detecting um, uh, billions of photons of light and the direction at which they hit the telescope. Well, I should say uh, uh, we do in the radio wavelengths. We don't in optical, which is the, the telescopes that I was showing you. So, uh, okay, so I'm going to amend my question for you right now, or my answer for you right now, which is in the radio, this is what's being developed, um, where then uh, this is well, it's called radio interferometry, where you can, uh, for each one of the radio photons, um, uh, then uh, construct the position in the sky where that's coming from. But this is, as far as making these large-scale maps of the universe, that hasn't been done yet. You can come work with and, him. Um, yes, and you can come with <laughs> exactly. Another question, and um, would, it, would, it, would there any be any other ways for the protein, the a beta um, to would the, from the larger protein from which it's cut. Would there be any other possible or cut proteins that could be made from the larger protein? Oh yeah, yeah. There's a whole families of proteins. In fact, I didn't I didn't go into the whole story. I, I, I kept it simple. So I showed you the two enzymes that cleave that protein to make the A beta molecule. But there's actually a third enzyme that cleaves the A beta right in the middle. Uh, and so if you think that the activity of that protein, of all three proteins, it would actually create a whole bunch of little fragments together. And some of those fragments actually seem to have messenger functions and, uh, as well, but we don't, we don't really fully understand them. But that protein that cleaves, the, uh, cleaves it in the middle actually prevents that amyloid molecule from forming. And so if there was a way to increase the activity of that enzyme, you'd also be able to have an effect on all of this, but you'd create a lot of these small little proteins that would then be floating around. Thanks. So let's have a round of applause for the parents of these very smart children who are encouraged them to be our future scientists. Next question over here. Yes, a question uh, from Mina Bissell. Um, you made a reference to uh, metastases and some new information that might be relevant there. Could you speak on that for a moment? Sure. So. Um, the reason we succeeded in making um, the kind of discoveries we did for reversion, et cetera, was because we made models in culture. We made these three-dimensional models that allowed us to answer the kind of question we couldn't ask inside a mouse, or thank goodness, we cannot do it inside humans, right? So we, it occurred to us that one of the most important things about which we know nothing is models which explain why when you have cancer and you remove the tumor, many, many years later, um, the tumor comes back. And people say, well, where did these cells went and sat down? Where, how were they quiet? What was happening, right? That's called dormancy. So my bioengineer postdoc, who just is getting professorship um, uh, offers, uh, came to my lab and I said to him, you know, don't ask little thing with this and a little thing with that, ask the big question. He knew a lot about formation of blood vessels, it's called angiogenesis, and I said, what is the most important unknown question? And he said, well, metastasis and dormancy. I said, okay, make a model. So what he did, and he had a lot of knowledge about this, and this is going to be published in probably this coming month 
in Nature Cell Biology as a big article, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it would go on the cover. I hope it's a very important piece of work that I'm very excited about. So what he did was that he took and made the microenvironment of blood vessels, we call them a niche of, or the stroma. He took it from uh, one from the bone marrow and he took another one from the uh, lung. Then on the top of that, he allowed cells that make blood vessels in vivo and he allowed them to make blood vessels. We can do that. And I wish I could have shown you. Next time I come talk to you, I look at all my slides before. <laughs> and <laughs> I want it because I thought this is what it was, but I didn't have it tonight because this wasn't ready. But they made blood vessels. And, and then he did a whole lot of other experiments with animals and he was shocked to find out that the cells that become dormant actually sit on the trunk of the blood vessel. You know, the blood vessel is like a river or like a tree, like whatever. The trunks are one way and the tips are a different way. And when there is inflammation or other kind of signal in vivo, then the tip of these blood vessels start growing and when you have a tumor, they actually the tips grow. He found that the cells that are dormant actually sit on blood vessels and we even know what actually is doing it. We did a whole lot of things like mass spec, et cetera, et cetera, and we now know what are the compounds, what are the molecules that actually are there on the trunk of the blood vessel that make the cells dormant. Then we discovered that because we're making the entire blood vessel in a dish, it was the most beautiful demonstration of microenvironment because the tip of the blood vessel that was growing, now if a tumor cell was next to that, that grew like crazy. And we know what are the factors that did that. So we now can make a biotherapeutics for those that are actually growing and also try and keep those single quiet ones quiet for as long as we can. And it's very exciting. So. It comes out in Nature Cell Biology for those of you who, who look up at it. So look under Bissell and it will come up. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Next question over here, please. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit of a story to get to the question, otherwise it won't make sense. But in the, in the pursuit of science, in my experience, it's a lot like the pursuit of the truth. The closer you get to it, the farther away you realize you really are. And so in that context, uh, seven years ago, I was running two ethanol plants in the Midwest. And I knew that we were going to hit a dilemma when corn hit 375, our profitability was gone. 375 a bushel today, it's 782. So it is not the resource that we thought it was. But I used to pick up my daughter's assistant from school, and she was standing outside in the winter while the school buses were belching diesel and breathing those fumes, and at the same time, the small town we were in announced that the EPA said the yeah, sewage system had to be changed because of the affluence that were coming out, and I had the idea, it was just an intuition, and I want to throw it back to you, that didn't we have 60% of the constituents of fuel in the human sewage? That's my question. Yeah, let me see that. Go ahead. So absolutely, um, and uh, there's a there are many subpopulations within renewable energy and many sectors that are working on various elements of it. Um, and you know your first point about corn uh, is very well taken, and I think that's why there's been this massive shift towards non-food feedstocks to try and break the linkage between food prices and energy prices. I think that's step one. Uh, step two is waste to energy is another big part of it, and. Uh, anaerobic digesters or microbes that can take the municipal solid waste, um, that includes landfill and sewage processing, and turn those into hydrocarbons is something that is really gaining momentum. And I think you're going to see, um, and again, I, I'm not a proponent of a silver bullet, I'm a proponent of the silver shotgun, and there's plenty of room at the bottom and the top to try and make an impact in what we do. And I think uh, for sewage in particular, it's a distributed resource. I think we can all appreciate that. Um, and, uh, and it's produced everywhere. And if you can 
and it's typically not as high energy density as wood or some others, but you can still derive an opportunistic energy source from it, if done appropriately, and then pump it into the energy distribution. And for big cities and metropolitan areas, uh, waste energy, be it cooking oil, be it human waste, be it landfill, there's a lot of potential there to really make these urban centers energy independent. And um, there are a lot of ongoing active research projects around that. Thank you. Thank well, you. It, well, it would be a good source of sustainable biodiesel. Absolutely. And, 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 it, and if I may, the, there are some work uh, going on in the Central Valley that's looking at trying to capture gases that come out of slaughterhouses uh, because it's high density agriculture. And I'm not a big fan of that, uh, uh, high density slaughterhouses. But you can still capture that methane. And they're actually developing a pipeline to send it to LA. Um, <laughs> So, now, now, now. I'll, uh, I'll leave that, you know, for you okay, to judge. Thank, thank you for your question. We have another question here. Uh, Schiel. Um, my question is, for astral bodies such as black holes and singularities that have such high gravity that light that hits them does not bounce off, it is simply sucked in to the vacuum or void, uh, how would you record those and, I guess, T photograph them, uh, put them into your map of the universe if you have no idea what they look like? Uh, so that's a great question. Okay, a question about black holes. And I should say black holes, at one point, they were a candidate for the dark matter in the universe. So this, uh, whatever these particles are that are five times more massive than all the uh, protons, electrons, neutrons. Um, but it turns out they're not. Um, so, but we do know where the black holes are now, and they're mostly in the center of the most massive galaxies in, in the universe. And we see them just by their gravitational effects on uh, other objects, so mostly stars going around the centers of galaxies. And so most spectacularly, this has been mapped out in the center of our own galaxy, in the center of the Milky Way, with the Keck telescope, where there are actually pictures of um, uh, stars moving around the central black hole on time scales of just years. So the, the gravitational well is that strong that you can see that. So the, obviously these are objects that aren't close enough that they're within the event horizon of the black hole, but um, further out than that. Uh, so we can then from that derive the mass of those black holes. Uh, and uh, basically we know that the only thing that they could possibly be are black holes. Well, yeah, that's how location. Also, I was I heard a while back on the internet that uh, you were using the shadows of these black holes as a way to figure out their shape as well as their location. Is that true? Uh, I guess I'm not quite familiar with that. So, the, uh, so I should say in the overall cosmic energy density equation, the black holes are a tiny, tiny fraction of the total energy density. So I'd, I guess I should say, so right. personally, this isn't my area of research, so I, I don't know much more than I already said. Th thanks for your question. Uh, take another one over here. We're gonna have it wrap it up uh, pretty quickly here. We'll take, take a few more. Okay, so I have a question for Ron. So um, when you have the proteins, right, the natural ones, when you add a certain catal catalyst, they'll form, they'll shape, they'll change their shape, they'll fold in a certain way, right? So when you have your artificial proteins, and if you were if you have like the the brick shape, right, whatever, and then you were to add a certain catalyst, could you change the shape again to create like a new material, sort of? If you were to like, if you have so you have these nano sheets, you said right. So if you have nano sheets and you have a material of a plane made out of nano sheets, because I like that idea, <laughs> but. <laughs> You have a plane made out of nanosheets, and then you, boom, add a catalyst, and then all of a sudden you have a plane, but now it's larger because the nanosheets expanded. If the brick shape turned into a square shape, let's say. So that's sort of, yeah. Yeah, so uh, for sure the, I mean, so you don't even need to add a catalyst for one to get most, many proteins to fold. So um, there was the Nobel Prize given in, in the 70s for the idea that just, that proved that just a linear chain could fold into a, an active enzyme with no other, just in water. Um, but it's, tr it's an excellent point that most 
proteins are stimulus responsive. So like Nina was saying, they, there are things they respond to in their environment. And so we can learn from that and incorporate that into um, these non-natural materials. So um, we can put, for example, photoactivatable groups inside the sheets and change their shape, make, make them change their thickness or their porosity by adding certain stimulus. So um, we are trying to learn all the tricks from nature and try to copy them. Thank That's you. A question. Thanks. When, when over here? Yeah. Um, so I've got a question for Blake, kind of a general question. Um, I recently read an anthropological study that kind of tracked the amount of effort and time and work involved in producing, say, a, a single lumen of light. And they found that while a single lumen of light uh, has become quite a bit easier to get, um, whether you measured by dollar or in, you know, cavemen era, just time required to get a, a lumen of light and effort put in. Um, overall, our society uh, per capita is, is spending a lot more effort and money and however you measure it on providing, say, light. And there are many other measures. It could be light or something else. And I was just wondering how you incorporate this into your research um, of these, these new uh, renewable fuels um, that even if you make something more efficient, which light has obviously become more efficient with LEDs and such, uh, people, because it's more efficient, will use more of it. And, and overall, the total consumption can still increase. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And uh, uh, there's been a lot of thought that goes into it. And so um, first and foremost, uh, as I have mentioned in an uh, earlier response, conservation and changing in how we consume energy and how we become more energy efficient as uh, not only the United States, but as a, a global enterprise called humanity um, is really important. Now, we can evaluate technologies in a variety of different ways to make sure that we're maximizing efficiency, maximizing cost savings, and making sure that we can track uh, where the energy flows are going. Uh, and there are some really good river charts that track energy consumption and production in the world. Um, we do well-to-wheels analysis and solar-to-fuels analysis on the efficiency, but all of these gains in efficiency in the renewable sector are somewhat moot if we keep growing and consuming more and more and more uh, all the time. Uh, now, the rub of it is, is that the developing world doesn't really want to hear from the developed world about how to do things better, right? Uh, the, the, and so there's a balance of trade, uh, not only from the commodity scale on the energy sector, but also on the humanitarian scale, that we really want to see the developing world mature quickly in the state of technology and energy efficiency, but we need to do that in the right way. And to tell them to stop you know, or curtail their population growth is probably not the right way to do it. Um, so it, it, it's a mini tangled bush that we're trying to unravel, but you have to pay attention to the sustainability of the entire system of systems, because if you don't, you can really convince yourself that you've got a single point solution that leads to a systemic failure. And, and that's really a, a point of concern. So uh, point well taken. Good. Thanks for your question. So before we take our last question, I was going to ask Greg and Andrilla, considering that you guys finished close to your time, if there's any single point you want to add that we, I didn't let you add because of the time, time limit. Is there anything that comes to mind? I got everything in. You got everything <laughs> in? All right. Just barely. Is there anything, Andrilla, that you would like to add to yours? Um, we want you to come uh, to the open house of Lawrence Berkeley Lab. We have it either in spring. Jeff, when do we have it? In spring Actually, or fall? Actually, to be truthful. Mm. Well, watch we out for it. Clearly, we this is totally free form. <laughs> yeah, Actually, we're going to have a special a series of events uh, uh, in late October uh, that will include a day when you can come up to the lab and tour around but we're not going to have what we've had the last few years. It'll be a little different. We're going to have three days of things. It's, we're going to be more in the community this time, but you will be able to come to the lab and take tours. That's definitely but on the But you see, agenda. I see all these wonderful young people who are clearly very curious. Yes, And they have wonderful. all these questions, and they're articulate, and they want to talk to somebody. So they should come up and find these scientists on their bo those boots and stuff and ask questions. It would be wonderful. Well, they're all we using love it. They're all using social media, so please, they can send questions. We'll try um, to get them answered yes. as quickly as we can. So, Andrilla, to be fair, was there anything that we wanted to add that we didn't let you because of the time constraint? Um, I, I, I'd just like to add that uh, perhaps all, all the work that you hear here are actually interrelated. Um, Very good. I'd be a little hard-pressed to 
uh, add in the dark matter or the dark <laughs> energy. <laughs> but aside from that, it's actually all about balance and sustainability, whether we are talking about the microenvironment around uh, malignant tissue uh, versus a normal tissue or our policies regarding how we consume our materials. Um, you showed these beautiful images of futuristic Australia, <laughs> where they are putting these huge data gathering systems in the desert. I got the sense that there was some mistake that the deserts were a great place to put it. Um, because in fact, those deserts are alive. And if there are not any policies in place to figure out what will happen to the ecosystem of that desert, when you put in that kind of structure, you're going to have a whole other kind of problem to mitigate. So uh, there, there, is, there is this sense of big science and broad models that take a more global view of any solution and realize that it is not a silver bullet. Every problem we try to solve comes up with a whole new problem. And unless we understand what we are asking, we'll just create more problems. Great, excellent point. So you have the honor to ask the last question of the evening. Okay, thank you. Um, so this question is going to be for Dr. Jagas. Um, from my biochemistry um, classes in undergrad, I remember that the beta amyloid um, precursor, the amyloid precursor protein was actually cut in a different order by another, it wasn't beta or gamma secretase, probably the one in the middle. Um, and so I'm trying to think why the antibody therapy against um, amyloid beta, also the beta secretase inhibitors, haven't worked. And could it be because it's a ratio between the good and the amyloid beta, which just accumulates and forms plaques sort of as like a side effect? Because I know that neurons do have some wound healing properties, so it can't just be that, you know, when the plaques are gone, they should be able to repair and restore at least a little bit. And so what do you think about that? Well, you know, the, brain, the, the brain's ability to restore and repair is really very limited. There's really only a few areas in the brain that, that uh, do what we call neurogenesis. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look in the brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease, it's just vastly disturbed, vastly damaged, way more than those parts of the brain that can actually generate new neurons. So the ability, plus the older we get, the, the harder it is to generate <laughs> neurons, true. and especially they don't, you don't just generate the neurons, you have to generate the appropriate connections, and those mm -hmm. connections are formed over the life, especially uh, when you're young. Those mm -hmm. connections are really formed uh, in youth during, during development. So I think the process of, of hoping that neurogenesis or stem cells, for example, are gonna, is gonna solve the problem, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly a, a reasonable approach, but we're very, very far away from that. I think we're further away from neurogenesis or stem cell therapy than we are from the idea that maybe we could prevent this whole process in the beginning. But th they're both approaches that we have to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So please tell your friends about Berkeley Lab. Word of mouth is very important. Please tell them. I hope you've enjoyed this evening. This concludes our presentation. Thank you, scientists, and thank you, audience, for your applause. The video will be available on our website uh, by tomorrow, we hope, and then there will be a, a broadcast quality one that comes later. And uh, those of you who are friends of Berkeley Lab, please look for uh, information about our fall series, which will begin on September 9th. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>